Lecture 29 The Trickster in Mythology In our last lecture, we finished our unit on heroes. This time, we start a new unit on tricksters. Tricksters turn out to be nearly ubiquitous in world mythology, and despite the fact that they take different forms in different cultures, they have a lot in common. In this, in this lecture, we would like to define the trickster and then treat one cycle about tricksters in a more extended way, and then end up by talking about some of the ways in which students and scholars have understood this really enigmatic figure. In order to define the, the trickster, let me start with a, with a, a, a definition that comes from uh, or, uh, Erdos and Ortiz, a book on Native American tricksters. Their definition is specific to Native American tricksters, but it has a lot in common with others, as we'll see. They say, of all the characters in myths and legends told around the world through the centuries, courageous heroes, scary mo monsters, rapturous virgins, it's the trickster who provides the real spark in the action. Always hungry for another meal swiped from someone else's kitchen, always ready to lure someone else's wife into bed, always trying to get something for nothing, shifting shapes and even sex, getting caught in the act, ever scheming, never remorseful. That is, as they define him, a trickster is, is almost always an apparently low character who outwits the high and the mighty, but in the process he frequently overreaches himself and outwits himself, gets caught in his own traps. In literature, he shows up as such characters as Till Eulenspiegel in Germany or Reynard the Fox in France. In mythology, we'll encounter him as such characters as Hermes in, in Greek mythology, Anki in Sumerian mythology, or Loki in uh, Norse mythology. In the old world, the trickster is usually a, a human figure, maybe even a god or a giant. But in the New World and Africa, um, the trickster is usually associated with an animal that can assume human form, or at least is associated with an animal in some way. Iktomi is Spider-Man. Then, and there are also tricksters who are ravens, minks, hares, blue jays, and most especially coyote, the best known of him of the tricksters, I guess. Um, perhaps, as we've seen in earlier lectures, um, the reason why animals are so much more frequently tricksters in African and Native American mythology than other parts of the world, is that these cultures may see a closer relationship between humans and nature, particularly a closer relationship between humans and animals than is true of the old world. The trickster is always male. Female tricksters are very rare, and he's always on the move. In an amazing number of cases, the trickster is, is the special protector of doorways, of crossroads, of boundary markers, of all those places where in and out, where we and they, where here and there meet. He's always a traveler, and he's almost always a messenger between heaven and earth and the underworld. And quite frequently, he also accompanies the souls to the land of the dead. The newly died people accompanies their souls into the underworld. And usually, because he lives on these edges, on these borders all the time, he usually messes up the boundaries between these places. Lewis Hyde, um, in a really good book called Trickster Makes This World, says this about the trickster. He says, all tricksters are on the road. They are lords of in-between. A trickster does not live near the hearth. He does not live in the halls of justice, the soldier's tent, the shaman's hut, the monastery. He passes through each of these when there is a moment of silence, and he enlivens each with mischief, but he is not their guiding spirit. He is the spirit of the doorway leading out and of the crossroad at the edge of town, the one where a little market springs up. He is the spirit of the road at dusk, the one that runs from one town to another, and he belongs to neither. If we remember in Greece, there were little statues of Hermes that were sometimes called Herms that were used in Greece to mark doorways. And those little herms were perfect symbols for the trickster because they were placed in such a way that he's never in one room or the other, neither indoors nor out, but part of both, very often carrying the part of one into the other. And so offerings for tricksters are most frequently placed at crossroads, at that precise place where two roads meet. What motivates the trickster 
our appetites, especially appetites for food and sex and mischief. In art and literature, tricksters are frequently ithophallic, that is, they are given oversized sex organs. That's certainly true of those little herms that we talked about a moment ago. And in myths, they often have enormous stomachs or intestines, um, again, to show the scale of their appetites. They try to satisfy these appetites through deceit rather than hard work, and they relish what they get far more when they achieve a good meal or a night with a maiden or somebody else's wife by guile rather than through hard work. But they are also often tripped up by their own schemes. They're humiliated, they're wounded, sometimes even killed, although never for long. And often they appear as clowns or buffoons in their own stories. So that a trickster can look like an idiot. He can shift shapes and he can trick the gods and he can outthink everybody but he's always in danger of overreaching himself and winding up in filth and disgrace. And yet, and here's the and yet, and yet that really makes him an interesting character, he is also a culture hero who participates in important ways in the creation of the cosmos or helps to arrange it in forms that humans have been living in ever since. He steals fire from the gods, he regulates the course of the sun, he brings water to earth to create rivers, he kills monsters, he introduces plants and animals to serve as human food. He also quite frequently introduces disease or death into the world, and he often makes life harder for humans than it was. And it's interesting, it's important to remember that he doesn't help because he's altruistic or harm because he's malicious. He's simply driven by his own appetites and by his love of mischief. Sometimes what he does helps humans, sometimes it doesn't. The trickster doesn't very often pay attention to the consequences since he's not motivated by concern for humans or contempt for them. He just does what he does and things happen. Still, he is by almost every culture that has a trickster, he's considered a culture hero and he's a revered figure in the mythology, perhaps even considered sacred. Uh, Claude Levi Strauss, the French anthropologist, calls the trickster a bricolure, that is, a fix it person, a tinker, who takes whatever materials are available and then puts them together in new ways. In the process, he redefines categories and the way things are. Along those same lines, William Hines, in an article called Mapping the Character Characteristics of the Mythic Trickster, goes on from Claude Levi Strauss's definition to say this. Accordingly, the trickster traffics frequently with the transcendent while loosing lewd acts upon the world, gastronomic, flatulent, sexual, phallic, and fecal feats erupt seriatim. Yet the bricolure aspect of the trickster can cause any or all of such acts or objects to be transformed into occasions of insight, vitality, and new inventive creations. That's what makes the, the, the trickster such an interesting figure, that a low character on the one hand involved in a lot of pretty weird stuff, much of it scatological, on the one hand, and on the other hand, an important culture hero, and it's that odd combination that makes him such an interesting figure. I want to illustrate t today, uh, to, to begin our, our consideration of tricksters, with a few episodes from a cycle of trickster tales. This from the Winnebago, Winnebago people of Wisconsin and surrounding area. This cycle was published by Paul Radin in a book called The Trickster, a study in American Indian mythology. A cycle of trickster stories is simply a, a group of independent narratives that are woven together into one coherent story. The central character of this one has a name that means something like the tricky one. The cycle, Radin tells us, was in place by 9, 1912, but he thinks that the elements that make it up are much, much older. So we can get a pretty clear sense by looking at this cycle what this character means to the people who tell stories about him. The trickster begins this cycle as a war chief who decides to go on the warpath. Uh, a chief who decides to go on the warpath. Um, Radin says this is already a tip-off because a chief among the Winnebago cannot lead a war party himself. That's, that's taboo. So that when he announces he's going to lead a war party, we already know that we're dealing with an anomalous situation here. And then he breaks all kinds of other rules in the process. Three times he calls for a huge feast to get ready for the, for the departure onto the warpath. And all three times he leaves early. He leaves, that is, before the feast is done. Again, this is taboo for the host in a, in a Winnebago feast. Um, all three times when he leaves the party, he 
cohabits with women, as we are told, and that too is taboo for someone about to go on the warpath. When after the fourth feast, he actually does lead his, his warriors out onto the warpath, he first breaks his war bundle, which is a huge violation, a great, great violation of taboo. Um, he breaks his arrows, and then he wrecks his boat. By the time he does this, all of his followers have deserted him. They've, they've left. This, this man obviously isn't serious about going on the warpath. They've left him, and from here on out, he becomes a solitary wanderer traveling by himself. There are 49 episodes in this cycle, so we, we'll, we can only do a few of them here. I've chosen some that either appear in other Native American trickster tales or ones that we'll want to come back to and talk about later. In one of them, he comes to a lake where ducks are swimming and he's hungry. So he tells the ducks that he knows that they love to dance. And so he says he'll sing to them so they can dance if they'll keep their eyes shut while they dance. They do, and as he's singing and they're dancing, he one by one wrings the necks of one duck after another. One duck finally cheats by opening its eyes and sees what's happening, and he warns the others who fly away, but the trickster by now has a fairly good supply of ducks for his dinner. He roasts them, and then he decides to take a nap before he eats. When he goes to sleep, he asks his anus to stand guard, um, make sure that those ducks are safe. A group of foxes come by, lured by the scent of, of roasted duck, and the anus does its best to scare off the foxes by making whatever noises it can. Eventually, however, the, uh, the foxes come to realize that all it can do is make noise, and they make off with the ducks. When the trickster awakens, he's furious with his anus, and so he punishes it by burning it with a hot brand, and of course screams in pain because it's his own anus. Later in the cycle, he's going to come across pieces of fat lying on the road, and he eats them. Only later does he realize that those are, he's eating his own intestines, which have fallen out because he burned his anus. Um, that's, a, that's a typical trickster story from this cycle. In another episode, he runs out of food, and there's a lot of food in the next village, so he decides that he has to somehow infiltrate that next village where he can have access to the food. So he makes a vulva for himself out of an elk's liver and then changes himself into a woman, goes to the village, marries the chief's son, and actually over a period of three years bears three children to the, to the chief's son. But one day the chief's wife, that is his mother-in-law, teases him and he starts to chase her. And when he chases her, his fake vulva falls off and again he has to run for his life. In another episode, he comes across a, a, a plant that says to him, he who eats me will defecate. And the trickster says, look, I decide what I eat and when I eat and when I defecate. So he eats a lot of the buds or the berries or whatever it was that were on this, this um, tree. What happens immediately after that is that, shortly after that, is he does begin to break wind more and more violently until he's finally required to hang on to tree limbs from, to keep from getting blown up into the sky. Then he does begin to defecate so abundantly that he's forced eventually to climb a tree to just to keep himself out of this growing mountain that's from down below. Um, eventually, however, this happens to tricksters a lot, he loses his grip on the tree and falls down into this amazing pile of dung, his own. And now, totally polluted, he, has, he runs, just runs. He can't see where he's going. He keeps banging into trees until he finds his way to water, where he jumps in and washes himself. In another story, um, he hears a voice as he's traveling along the road. He hears a, a voice making fun of his penis because of its size, because it's so large. Um, it is so large, in fact, that he carries it in a box on his back. Um, he discovers that the voice belongs to a chipmunk, and so he starts to chase the chipmunk. The chipmunk runs into a hole in the tree, and then he sends his penis in after the chipmunk, who keeps chewing off bits of it until it gets down to what's now considered to be pretty much normal size. The trickster gathers up all of those pieces um, that the chipmunk has, has chewed off, and then he scatters them as he leaves, and every place where a piece of it falls, an edible plant grows up. Uh, a plant that later on can be used for human food. Um, finally, one last uh, little episode. He begs dinner from a variety of other animals. He's always hungry, and he's always stopping at somebody's house for dinner. Um, in one sequence, he, he goes to three different animals, to a muskrat, to a woodpecker, and a polecat, each of whom reluctantly allows the trickster to stay for dinner. And each time the, the animal, the, the woodpecker, the muskrat, the polecat, goes out and hunts 
dinner in his own particular way. Every time the trickster then says, well, and thank you for feeding me. Come back to my house tomorrow night and I'll feed you. And, but each time when the guest shows up, he tries to replicate his host from the night before, his hunting method, and he fails. Each time, therefore, the guest himself has to go out and capture dinner. Each time the dinner gets provided, and every time the trickster tells his family that he's done the work of acquiring it, each time the guest has to provide not only his own dinner, but that of the trickster and his family as well. At the very end of the Winnebago cycle, this one at the end of the 49 episodes, Trickster gives over his mischief and he travels down the Mississippi in the process clearing the Mississippi of obstacles to travel and then he leaves the earth, going, re returning to heaven where he presumably came from in the first place and at the end of this story he's put in charge of the underworld. Well, that's only a tiny part of the cycle but it gives you an idea of what kind of adventures the Trickster has. The question for us is, what do we do with stories like this? What can we make of them? Um, what is the trickster character in mythology all about? Radin, who himself, who collected and published this Winnebago cycle, has his own theory about what these stories are about, what they mean. He gives, in his introduction to this cycle, he gives a very Jungian reading. In fact, it is so Jungian that Carl Jung actually wrote an essay of introduction to this text in which he gives a slightly larger Jungian context for Radin's reading. For Radin, the cycle is a fable or a parable about the first half of life in which an infantile character becomes a socially responsible being. In the first episodes, that is the trickster who begins as war chief, I told you those episodes, he violates every important taboo of his people, suggesting, Radin says, that he is totally desocialized. He breaks all ties with other people in society. He has no ethical values at all. He's still living entirely as an unconscious bundle of instinctual drives, and those instinctual drives are symbolized by the massive intestines which he has to wrap around himself or the massive penis which is so large he has to carry it in a box on his back. Radin says that over the 49 episodes he gradually comes to self-consciousness. It takes a long time because he begins life as such a primitive being. He begins life with the consciousness in fact of a newborn child. He learns a lot in his wanderings. Most of the things, the bad things that happen to him are the kind of things that happen to people who live at a purely instinctual level. When he kills his first buffalo, for example, his two hands start fighting against each other and his left hand actually gets wounded by his right hand. When he sets his anus to guard the ducks, he treats his anus as though it's something independent, not part of himself. In both episodes, he learns his body parts. He learns that the body parts are parts of himself and can't be treated as independent things. Along the way, he learns some things about the world around him, even though he's not quite ready yet to take responsibility for his own actions. One night, he falls asleep under a blanket, and when he wakes up in the morning, the blanket is sailing like a banner, like a flag high, high in the sky. What he realizes, it's resting on his own penis. Again, he doesn't seem to understand that this is part of him, that this has anything to do with him. And because he, what he says, in effect, when he looks up, he says, I don't know, stuff like this is happening, to, it happens to me all the time. I have no idea what's going on. Um, how meaningless and undifferentiated his sex drive is at the beginning is indicated in a story when he sends his penis underwater to have intercourse with a chief's daughter on the other side of the river. So what the, what the, what the trickster has to learn along the way, according to Radin, is he has to learn sex differentiation, he has to learn to control his appetites. That happens symbolically when he burns his own anus and then eats his own intestines, getting them down to size, and the chipmunk chews off parts of that large penis of his, which gets that down to size. That his discarded penis become el it becomes edible. Plants for Radin suggest that he's slowly transforming from generalized and natural and procreative force, a bundle of instinctual energies, into a culture hero, because this is one of the things that culture heroes do. Radin says, admits that the progress is very slow and has many setbacks. Um, often, very late in the cycle, the trickster seems to be not that much different than he was at the beginning. But Radin still believes that his reading of the cycle works. 
which records memories of each of us as individuals and humans as a species before we reach full consciousness and the kind of effort it takes to get there. This is what Radin says about his own reading. He says, what may we ask is the content? What is the meaning of this original plot? About this, there should be little doubt, I feel. It embodies the vague memories of an archaic and primordial past, where as yet where there as yet existed no clear-cut differentiation between the divine and the non-divine. For this period, trickster is the symbol. His hunger, his sex, his wanderings, wandering, these appertain neither to the gods nor to man. They belong to another realm, materially and spiritually, and this is why neither gods nor man knows precisely what to do with them. I like that definition particularly in that he, what he does is he also points out that in-between status of the trickster, which is something we've learned from Hyde and in an earlier quotation. Um, everyone admits Radin's importance in the uh, study of the trickster, but not everybody agrees with his reading of the cycle or the meaning of the trickster in general. There are a lot of alternative readings, some of them really quite interesting. Um, e. E. Evans Pritchard uh, published a book called Zondi Trickster Stories from Africa, and his thesis is that these are not primitive stories at all, but they're relevant to every society here and now. As he says, the Azandi people tell these stories to their children. The trickster in these stories is a liar, a cheat, a lecher, a murderer, he's vain, he's greedy, he's ungrateful, he's a braggart, he's everything that parents try to train out of their children, and yet they tell these stories to their children with enthusiasm and without moralizing them. So Evans Pritchard says the reason for this is that no matter what he does, the trickster is always an endearing character. He's not malicious. He is simply whimsical, he's reckless, he's irresponsible, he's always eager to show off, and he's always willing to, this, this Evans Pritchard finds this particularly delightful, he's always willing to lose himself entirely in song and dance. Evans Pritchard says that he thinks there's something in this trickster character of a kind of combination of Don Quixote and Falstaff from Shakespeare's play and Charlie Chaplin's on-screen character, or even, he says, something of Toad of Toad Hall in Kenneth Graham's Wind in the Willows. That combination, he says, is what allows Zandi parents to reach past the moralizing to welcome into their stories and give to their children this really puckish, engaging character. In other ways, Evans Pritchard said, the trickster does what many of us would still like to do ourselves. The trickster in his cycle of stories kills his father, he tries to kill his own wife and son, he has sex with his mother-in-law and maybe even with his own sister. He flouts every possible convention of a Zandi life. And what, what Evans Pritchard said is that what he's doing is he's expressing the infantile parts of ourselves that we have repressed, but we've never fully eliminated from our psyches. They said maybe what happens when we listen to and tell trickster stories is we're looking at ourselves in a distorting mirror, but a mirror that may not be as, as much distorted as we think it is. We may really, he says, be like that underneath whatever growing up and training we've achieved to keep all those antisocial impulses at bay. Each of us, he says, finds ourselves a little bit in the trickster. And here's what he says about this aspect of his thesis. What Ture, Ture is the name of the Azandi trickster, what Ture does is the opposite of all that is moral. And it is all of us who are Ture. He is really ourselves. Behind the image, convention bids us present in desire, in feeling, in imagination. And beneath the layer of consciousness, we act as Ture does. A student of, of Evans Pritchard uh, named uh, Brian Street in an essay called The Trickster Theme, Winnebago and Azandi, in which he compares the trickster in, in Africa and the trickster in, um, in the Winnebago series, says that he thinks the purpose of the trickster is to manage a, just a brilliant, delicate balancing act between creativity and destructiveness. So the trickster can be simultaneously a revolutionary on the one hand and a cultural savior on the other. The Azandi trickster, Ture, always works on the borders, showing how those borders are defined by his culture and then violating them to show what happens when they're violated. What happens when they are violated isn't always bad. It can be good for a culture to have to redraw its boundaries. And we'll come back to this on our last lectures on tricksters because I think this is an important aspect of the trickster.
The point is that the trickster always challenges all the assumptions of a culture, which isn't itself in itself a bad thing. It, because tricksters always cause cultures to redefine themselves, and that's why a trickster can also be a culture hero. Claude Levi Strauss, the French anthropologist who we've mentioned before, says that he thinks a trickster is always a mediator between incompatible positions. Between, for example, the demand for sexual gratification on the one hand and the demands of the social order on the other. Michael Carroll um, takes off from Levi Strauss's definition in an essay called the, the Trickster is Selfish, Buffoon and Culture Hero. And he points out that, as he takes this directly from Freud, that all human beings desire both immediate gratification on the one hand and the ordered structures of civilization on the other. But the two are always incompatible since one destroys the other. The trickster manages to combine incompatible desires by gratifying enormous appetites on the one hand and being a culture hero on the other. How does he manage? Well, tricksters are always solitary. They're always traveling outside the boundaries of civilized life. And they're always associated with nature and with animals. In the wilds, the trickster can indulge his appetites without threatening culture, but at the same time he does so, he's always moving those boundaries and he's forcing civilization to redefine itself in terms of his activities. He can also create culture and, and tricksters do this. He discovers fire, he teaches agriculture, he teaches boat building to his people. He allows us to have our cake and to eat it too, or not to have our cake, but to vicariously imagine that we do. Victor Turner, in a book called The Forest of Symbols, says that what he thinks the trickster does is he breaks down all categories and then intermingles them, creating new combinations and new anomalies. The trickster, Turner says, is like a court jester or a clown. He has a marginal status, but because of that status, remember he's always between two rooms. He's always at the crossroads. He's always at the city gate, right on the edge between in and out. He always can bring into the, cult, into the culture of which he's a part new possibilities. And then finally, Robert Pelton, in a book called The Trickster in West Africa, taking up Turner's insights and building on them, says that the trickster represents the possibility for all of us to enter into a liminal state. A liminal state is where we are between things, between here and there, not definitely in one or the other, but somewhere in between. And he says that for, what the trickster does is he makes permanently accessible to all of us the possibility of entering into that liminal state between here and there, between right and wrong, between approved and disapproved. Pelton says that the trickster, as long as there are trickster stories around, the trickster always represents this liminal state. And what he says is uh, about this, the trickster is a symbol of this liminal state and of its permanent accessibility as a source of recreative power. The trickster in this liminal state can break and invert cultural rules. He can mistreat guests. He can have sex with his mother-in-law or daughter-in-law. He can disregard the idea that words and deeds should be in harmony with one another. He can disrespect sacred power, and all of this not just for the sake of defiance, but to find new ways of defining what's outside and what's inside. He can move the boundaries that most of us think are permanently fixed. Every culture deals with its anomalies and its messy stuff by making a garbage heap outside the village fence. The trickster lives on that fence and frequently brings some of that garbage back in and makes us decide how to deal with it. We, he forces us to ask, was it really garbage in the first place? Should we have thrown it away? Should it have been put outside the fence? Or is there some, some worth, worthwhile thing we can do with it now that the trickster has brought it back in? The, uh, the British anthropologist Mary Douglas in an article called The Social Control of, of Cognition um, says, in fact, that she thinks this is exactly what tricksters do. He said that tricksters always are there to refute the notion that any given social order is absolute and objective. Every classifying system that we come up with excludes what it can't handle, but the trickster always lives on the edge between categories, between male and female, between good and evil, between approved and forbidden, and frequently he causes us to move those boundaries and in the process recreates culture. These are just some of the ways that we can think about the trickster. We'll, we'll continue our examination of the trickster next time. We'll take a look at some examples from around the world 
and in the process, maybe come a little bit closer to understanding what this enigmatic and interesting character is all about. Specifically, we'll take a look at Hermes from Greece, Enki from Sumeria, Loki from Norse mythology, and then Maui from Hawaii. That's our next lecture.